Good morning, good afternoon, good night peeps. I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK and bringing you um, information and updates about a video that's been going around. It's got masses of views. Um, but it's important that, well, I thought it was important because I wasn't sure whether um, the information was current and whether you had all the information you needed to make an informed decision. And the video I'm talking about is the one that's been going around about England is a dump and Africa is paradise. Now, for the purposes of video of this video, and because Africa is so magnanimous and so large, I've decided to focus on Gambia, which is where Juliet, um, a.k.a. Woda, um, I forget her last name. But anyway, we'll call her Juliet for now. Woda Mayer, that's it. Um, where she currently lives with her husband, who's from uh, Montserrat. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the video because I really do not agree with her calling England a slum. Because I believe that wherever you go in the world, there's poor and there's rich and there's in between. And I do not believe that you should bite the hand that fed you. And that's what I'm going to start off with now. But for let me just show you the video for those of you who haven't seen it. I'm sure with the number of views that she's had, maybe the majority of you have seen it. But, you know, I'm going to give my little, you know, me and my opinion. OK. The UK is not a nice place to live. I'll be honest with you. All these people that are trying to go the back way, think again. It is not what you think it is. The UK, there are high levels of poverty at the moment. 14 million, well, 14.3 million people live under the poverty threshold. Um, in terms of homelessness, the density of homelessness is high. The only thing that saves England is, if you like, the um, benefit system. But other than that, England is an absolute dump. It's a dump. And London is a dump. You have small pockets of nice areas, as you do in every country. But for me, England is a dump. There are high levels of uh, desanitation. There are issues um, around racism. Terrible, terrible, terrible racism. I mean, where, how can you live in a place where you're not wanted? How can you live in a place where you're not welcome? And how can you live in a place where people are hostile to you almost every single day? You, you can't live your life like that. You cannot live. And money, no matter how much money or little trinkets or little things they want to give you, it is never going to justify um, having to suffer and your children having to suffer. What to live in a little matchbox house when you can live in a beautiful palatial palace like this with, with a, a swimming pool where you can pick coconuts and mangoes and oranges and live with people who like you? Oh, come on. The people in here like you? They love me. Oh. <laughs> She's on fire. Yeah, I'm, no, like, for real, I'm loving this interview. Like, I really did not expect this. But for real, we need to continue. This is not a 10-minute video. This should be an hour video. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know, like, you know, like, this is very important. For you telling me that the people in here love you. They don't even like you. They love you. Yeah. I, want, I want you to stress on that because, like, this is something I really want people out there to know. Because a lot of people are saying that whenever they come to Africa... Africans are not going to like that. Oh, listen. This is our home. We are black. When you come here, the first thing they said to me is, welcome back to your spiritual home. Wow. That's what they said to me. I didn't get that when I went to Jamaica. I didn't get that when I went to America. I didn't get that when I went to Europe, Spain, France, Turkey, Portugal, Italy. I didn't get that when I went to Mauritius. I didn't get that when I traveled to Cuba. I didn't get that in all of the places that I've been. I didn't even get that in Tunisia, Morocco. I didn't get that uh, when I went to Egypt. I, but I got that when I came back to the proper motherland, which I call, you know, Black Africa. And this is why, like I said, you have to make this your home. You're not living in England. You're surviving. You're, you're not even thriving. You're just about existing. And, and this is what we're doing. We're working to ourselves to death in England, literally. And the government are now trying to, uh, you know, make uh, you work harder for longer till 67, till you can retire. No. 
So many of my friends have died before they even got to my age because of stress and other illness, not eating good food, not, you know, not breathing good air, not eat, drinking clean water. This is the truth. This is the truth. Trinkets and technology don't make a society. People make a society. And in Africa, you have what I call true community, true love, true bonding, true unity. And that's why I'm here. Wow. You can make a business here. You can make a... Yeah. Um, thing is, is that, like you said, she does kind of make a disclaimer and say that... Um, there are pockets of England that are nice, but I would, I prefer to put it around the other way. I prefer to say there's pockets of slums or poor areas. I wouldn't even, wouldn't say slums as such. Well, maybe it's, it's, what I'm saying is it depends on your experience. If you experience um, where the slums are, then you're going to know that they exist and maybe the area that she was living was like that. But say, for example, for me, I don't see that. If I get sometimes go into the town centre, I see some people sleeping on the streets, but I don't really see slums. I don't really go to those. I haven't been to those places, let me say. I'm not saying they don't exist. We see rats cry, um, running all over the place, big rats, big like, whatever. So I haven't seen that. I haven't experienced what she's experienced. I haven't experienced the matchbox houses. The thing is, is that when I lived in Angola, I lived in Angola for about a year. And I was kind of privileged where I lived, but we lived in containers. And containers were, I think, about eight foot by four foot. That's what I would call a matchbox. But even then, I had a bed in there, a single bed. I had a little kitchen thing that you could cook on. I had a little wardrobe. And most importantly, I had my music. But even that was considered palatial to some of the indigenous Angolans who didn't have anything, who were like in, some of them didn't even have roofs on their houses. And sometimes we would go into the town centre, we'd jump into the truck and we'd get a lift to the town centre because we weren't allowed to go by ourselves. And I never thought I'd be afraid of the children. There was these little... Um, black boys I don't remember if I saw any girls but I remember seeing little black boys in shorts and they didn't have on any socks or shoes or anything it was just shorts and they were apart from the shorts they were naked and their skin was white I think from sea salt and their eyes were red and they were begging us for money but we were told that we shouldn't give them money because they, they you know, they're used to robbing. That you know, when they see where you take the money from, they would rob you. So it was a very conflicting seeing little what you perceive as being little children, who you would normally nurture and help and give money to, and yet you're kind of restricted because of the policy of the organisation I worked for. Here are the top search results. What can I say? But anyway, so all I'm saying is that in this particular situation, it depends on where you live, um, your social class, the amount of money you have. The people who welcome her are, are in a similar social class to, she, to what she is, and they're probably in the same money bracket. But had she built her home. I can't believe this. I feel like switching it off. But anyway, in um, I am going to have to switch it off in a minute if it goes off again. Um, but anyway, because it's kind of distracting me. But anyway, all I'm saying is that she lives, if she was to live in a poor place, in a poverty stricken place, they wouldn't welcome her in the same place, in the same way. You know, and also she was talking about you could buy a piece of land um, for £2,000. Um, it was, you don't have to have a mortgage. Um, but 
I don't know when she moved to the Gambia, but more recently, if you want to buy a property, if you want to buy a piece of land in the Gambia, it's going to cost you between ten and fifteen thousand, if not more. It's a bit like I'll use Luton again. I'll use Luton as an example again. If you um, in two thousand, in the year two thousand, you could get a property for forty nine thousand. It'd be just a flat, um, a two bedroom flat in the town centre for forty nine thousand five hundred. That same flat now is one hundred and twenty five thousand pounds. So similarly, depending on when you moved to the Gambia, the prices are going to be totally different than when you moved there to now which is going to be um, a lot different. Um, for those of people who want a already built, already constructed home, like with a swimming pool, what she has, it's going to cost you between 80,000 and 125,000, you know, but those houses didn't look great, the ones that I saw, but they were okay. Um, but like I said, if you wanted something a bit more elaborate then of course you're going to pay you're going to pay for it anywhere you go because the thing is um, the Gambians are welcoming the Brits now same like other parts of Africa but can you imagine a flood of Brits going to live in the Gambia maybe it's fine maybe it's big enough to accommodate them I don't know but you might find a situation like the UK where too many come in and then they start feeling threatened about their jobs. They start feeling threatened about the homes. Is there enough for us? These foreigners are taking our jobs. These foreigners are taking our homes. It might be a situation like that. I'm not saying it will be, but it could well be. A similar situation like that is happening in Turkey at the moment. They welcome Syrians, all these Syrian refugees, and what's happening now. They want to turf them out because they're taking all their jobs. They're filling up all their houses. So there's not much difference. Um, in what's this other country? Um, where's it down somewhere? Oh, it doesn't really matter. I'll I'll come across it at some point because I'm going to, when I read my notes. But it's like anywhere you go, um, the more people move in, the more pro the prices go up, and so people going to the Gambia now are not going to have the same experience as she had when she went. It was like she was special because she was like new. It's like when I first went to the job that I went to in the United States, I was a new Brit. I was welcomed with open arms. You know what I mean? And everywhere I went, I was welcomed with open arms. Now, it's flooded with people like me. I wouldn't get, a, I wouldn't even get a look in now, you know? So it's, times change, situations change, and prices change. And another thing, I'm going to put the video in the link for those of you who haven't seen it. She's had a massive amount of views. So a lot of black people have probably seen it. But if you haven't seen it, I'm going to put it in the link. I'm also going to put in the link a lot of research I've done. So if you are thinking about living in the Gambia, you've got more up to date information. You'll be you can make a better, a more informed um, decision if that's what your choice is. Um, I'm not knocking what she's saying. The only thing I don't I don't agree with is when she says you're a, you know the UK is a dump because it's almost like biting the hand that fed you. And also there's good and bad everywhere. Um, we also have to remember that with the UK you have free health care as of now. We don't know what's going to happen after after we leave the EU. Um, my instincts tell me that we're going to go privatised. If we go privatised, I think accessing a GP is going to be even more difficult. So it might be paralleled with the Africa and the Caribbean. I have looked up and I'm going to read it out later about their health care, um, about their visas, um, about taxes. I mean, she was speaking as though there was no taxes Um She's talking about all the taxes in England and how if you come here, 
you, you're kind of weighed down with so much tax you can't go back. But there are taxes in the Gambia um, that weren't mentioned. She mentioned the solar system, which is very, it's one of um, Gambia's greatest achievements. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. But really and truly, um, that was the main thing that I had um, a bee in my bonnet about because I didn't, I thought it was a bit biased. And yeah, you know, I should I really care? Yeah, I, I do care a little bit because, you know, a lot of people could jump on and think, oh yeah, I'm going to Gambia because of A, B, C, D and E. And yes, when you're amongst people that look like you, 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 you're, you don't feel as though you're going to be subjected to racism, but there's classism. And there's colorism. There's all. There are different forms of discrimination, regardless of where you go and where you live. And so, and there are slums, regardless of where you go and where you live. Anyway, let me just read my little notes here. Um, she spoke about the desanitation, but desanitation is everywhere. There's poverty. That's the first thing. Um, what else did she talk about? Welcome to my spiritual home. That must have been a wonderful feeling because Africa does give you that sense that it is. There's something about Africa that you cannot explain. You really cannot explain. It. It's almost like there's a peace. But like I said, depends on where you are and who you're with and your status. So I wouldn't have had that sense of peace and calm if I was in that village where all those little young boys were who's starving and staring at me, you know. But, you know, I found that I was able to overcome a lot of my fears, fears of big spiders. I mean, even now I'm back and away from them, I'm afraid. But there I wasn't afraid of those big spiders. And I went on this little boat and that took us to the other side of the lake or whatever you want to call it. And it was one of those boats that they used a string. And ordinarily I would be thinking, I'm not going to go in that, it's going to sink. But I got in that little boat and me and my colleagues went to the other side. And the guys, the little boys went in and they bought, they, they dive for fish. Not the same ones that were in that town, but these guys were different guys. I think they were children of the local people near to where I worked. And they jumped in and they got fishes and they fried them for us and we were sitting there. I mean, we were living the life of Riley. And that's what I'm saying. You can be in a place and be totally isolated from the devastation and the poverty. But that does not mean that that is how the country is all over. And that does not mean, I mean, I was treated like a queen um, by the local Angolans. But that does not mean that if I went outside my the safety of that environment, I would be treated the same way. They used to tell us not to go out because you could be kidnapped. Anything could happen to you. So, you know, you know, there's good and bad everywhere. Um, let me see. OK, let's talk about better quality of life. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn off my phone because I've got a funny feeling it's going to go off if I speak too loud. And I don't like to be restricted. So now I can relax. I don't have to think that that thing's going to go off. And if it goes off while it's on, then that will be really spooky. If it goes on while it's off, that's what I meant. OK, so hospitals in Gambia. Um, the Farafeni APRC General Hospital has beds for 250 patients and was built in 1999 to provide better health care for 300,000 Gambians living in the North Bank region. It is situated 200 miles up the river from Banjul. It was built in 1938 by the colonial government. There are four referral hospitals operated by the government, the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital, 
in Banjul and smaller hospitals at Bansang, Farafani and Buam. There are eight main health centres and further 16 smaller centres. So I don't know how big um, Gambia is, but it does seem to have quite a few hospitals or health centres at least. Um, let me see. Public expenditure on health in the Gambia was 1.8% of the GDP in 2004, whereas private expenditure was at 5%. There were 11 physicians per 100,000 persons in early 2000. Now that is kind of scary. 11 physicians for 100,000 people. Um, life expectancy at birth was 59 years, 59.9 years for females in 2005 and for male 57.7 years. Uh, Woda Mayer, aka Juliet, which is the young lady in that video, mentions that we are not eating good food or breathing good air in the UK. But once again, it depends on your status and where you live. Uh, the same because the thing is, like I was saying, if she was living in an um, impoverished part of Gambia, um, the water wouldn't be so great. And nor would the air, I would, well, the air probably can't do much about the air, but the water wouldn't be so great and the food wouldn't be so great. Um, the same class system we have in the UK probably exists in Gambia, where the rich have access to good food and better health conditions, and the poor have to make do with contaminated water and limited food supplies. Gambia visa and entry requirements. It's about a seven hours flight. It's about six hours something. Uh, British passport holders do not require a visa to gain entry into the Gambia. You are required to travel on your valid passport, valid at a minimum until the day of your flight arrival back to the UK. You need to check with the embassy of the Gambia in London. Um, you can stay for about 90 days, after which you must visit the Department of Immigration and Regularisation of your stay. So that sounds pretty straightforward. It does look like you can just get up and go if you want to. Um, you can stay for 90 days, check it out, and if you like it, you can make go back or plan to go back, which a lot of people have done, a lot of Black Brits have done. The only, you know, the only thing with the Gambia, I always think about Louisa Marx. I don't know why. She died of food poisoning, poisoning in, the, in the Gambia, and I know it was years and years and years ago, but, you know, I always remember that, and that's my you know, that's one of the bad memories I have. Um, okay, Woda, may I mention solar energy? And the Gambia is the first country in the world to ensure all its 1,100 rural schools and health centres will benefit from reliable energy supply using solar and battery technology. 20 MW solar energy and 400 km distribution project to transform energy access and cut costs. So that is quite um, an achievement. Um, okay, let me see. House prices versus building a property. Um, I couldn't find the, the current prices to build, but I understand from a friend of mine, um, well, actually, um, somebody who was on a video I was listening to the other day, built, built land and a house for 50,000. So they bought the land and built the house for 50,000. So that's not bad. But if you want an already constructed home, um, it's between 80,000 and 110,000 pounds for a reasonable home. Nothing palatial, nothing fantastic, but a moderate home that's comfortable. So I think the 2000 that Woden Mayer was talking about might be when she moved to the Gambia. But like I said, you know, the more people move into an area, the prices go up and, you know, things change. And like anywhere you go, when people start moving in, people don't like it. So, 
like they say, you know, as she said, there's a community spirit and Africa is such a, it's the largest continent in the world. So it can probably accommodate so many much more without feeling intimidated by us, providing, you know, we're, I guess, building up the economy, bringing money into the country. And yes, we do pay taxes. I mean, she did imply that we don't pay taxes in the video. And like I said, you can have a look at the video, but they do pay taxes in the Gambia. Um, anyway, let's get back to this. Um, oh, she mentioned that, you know, the Queen owns the land in the UK, but in the Gambia, it's your land. And by that, she means, you know, like if we did have a world war and um, you know, the government, there was some kind of national security thing, even if you've paid off your mortgage in this country, they can take your home and they can just move you out of it. I don't know where they put you, but they can move you out and just take over your home, even though you've paid for it. So I think that's what she's me, me, what she means. But in the Gambia, that home, you actually own the land you buy your house on. So that is a good thing. There are a lot of good things about moving to Africa. There really are. But it's just about having all the information you need to make an informed decision. Um, and the amount of people who are going out there is unbelievable. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite wonderful, really, because it really is about repatriation and taking that leap of faith to do that. Um, let me see what we have. Oh yeah, and like I said, um, you know, like everywhere you have the seven deadly sins, so you can be in a place and feel quite comfortable and happy and call it paradise, because that's what she's calling the Gambia. She's saying it's paradise because to her it is paradise when you compare it to where she seems like she lived in the UK, which she says was slums. She's talking about benefits. Um, she's talking about matchbox houses. And um, so she probably lived in a confined area. Um, in the UK where she was living and maybe a low income household. Um, I'm just making that assumption just from her references in the UK. It could be wrong. Um, but like I said, you know, even if you're living in um, a nice home, a palatial home, you've still got people who have the seven deadly sins. So you need to be really careful. You need to compose yourself. You need to be humble. You need to be respectful to everybody, regardless of who they are. You know, it no, it's no good going to Africa or anywhere and having an attitude of arrogance as though you're better than anybody else. Because I remember when we were young, at school, and I'm talking about years and years ago, they used to talk down to um, talk down about Africans a long time ago. And, you know, they used to talk about I mean, they used to do it about West Indians as well. But it was mostly Africans where they made us feel as though they they lived in mud houses or they was eating bananas or they didn't have any um, shoes on their feet. So we were miseducated when we were young. And so I can understand her excitement when she's going to the Gambia now and seeing how, you know, expensive and beautiful it is and, you know, how it's evolved over time. I'm not sure even say evolved over time because it's always been like that. It's just that we weren't aware of it. We weren't privy to that information. You know, we were constantly fed these pictures on our TV screens of flies and emaciated children. That's what all we've been fed. So we didn't get to know what Africa was really like. And when you think like the West Indies, it's normally the people who are looking for opportunities who come to the UK. So the more the poorer people who are trying to build up something, because the rich people that live in the West Indies and in Africa, they don't come to the UK. They don't need to come here. So it's the poorer people and the less educated people that used to come over and who were looking for opportunities. So when we used to see Africans or when the people saw West Indians, you know, they used to take the pee out of them. And so now 
you've you've gone back and now you see how wonderful it is it's just like whoa you've got to come over you've got to come over and yes it's fine asking people to come over but they need to know the facts they need to know what really to expect because a lot of people could be saying oh great i can go over there all i need is two thousand and i probably need about another four or five thousand and i can build a house don't have to pay no taxes, don't have to pay no electricity. I can live there, you know, comfortably. I can have a mortgage-free house for about 10 or 15,000. Not anymore, you can't. So all I want to do is kind of um, put this into perspective a little bit. I'm not, I'm not um, knocking, I'm not knocking her. I'm not quashing her dream. I'm not saying that Africa is not paradise. All I'm saying is that we need to put it in perspective. It depends on where you live. It depends on who you are. It depends on how you conduct yourself. It depends on who you know. And that goes for anywhere you live in the world. Um, she was talking about tax traps. She said in the UK, um, you know, you have TV tax for TV tax, council tax, car tax, congestion charge, transport um uh, I think she was, I don't know what transport, oh yeah, it, how expensive the transport is, yeah, I agree with that one, uh, but it's also expensive in Germany and in France, oh my god, it's really expensive, um, levy on fuel, she talks about value added tax, VAT, capital tax, capital gains tax, national insurance, contr contributions, Inherent inheritance tax, I put in stamp duty if you have a property and you can get trapped in the system and the benefit trap. She was talking about in that how, you know, how people leave their country of origin to come to the UK thinking they can make money and go back. And then they realise that they've got all these taxes to pay and then they can't afford to go back because they're entrapped. And she was talking about the brain drain, how, you know, Africans and West Indians have got are so clever have got such magnificent brains but they come to the uk and they're not allowed to use their brain they're dumbed down and so they they don't create like they would have done had they stayed in their country and when we all know how many black inventors there are and how many black famous people there are and how many black creators there are so you know by staying in their country, they could have brought wealth to their country instead of taking it to a country that doesn't appreciate them. So that is a valid point. Um, but with regard to the taxes, I found out that the Gambia, they also have taxes. So it was a bit misleading when she was talking about all those taxes without putting it into context and talking about, oh, Gambia has taxes too. It might not be as much as the UK, but non-residents are taxed on their Gambian source of income. Married couples are taxed jointly on unearned income. A married woman can only elect separate taxation if she receives earned or professional income. For any other income attributed to a married couple, it is deemed to be a husband's income for tax purposes. So that's like it's going back to, you know, before the emancipation and woman's liberation where, you know, um, the man held the woman. If they were married, the man was responsible for the woman's paycheck. Um, it was only kind of when we had the woman's liberation and all that, why women could use their money. But in Gambia, it looks like uh, as long as you're married, um, if you want to get some benefit of, of your tax, um, your husband um, will have that income or is responsible for it or will account for it or whatever. Uh, rental income. Rental income earned from leasing rental residential property is taxed at a flat rate for 8%. So if you buy a property in the Gambia and you rent it out, you ta you're taxed 8%. In computing for taxable income, repair and maintenance cost, interest and associated borrowings and depreciation are deductible from the gross rent. Capital gains tax. Capital gains are ex assessed and taxed under special rules. Capital gains may be taxed in two ways. 
with the option that results in higher tax liability as applicable method. Net gains are taxed at 15% or the 5% tax is levied on the selling price. Corporation tax is payable based on the higher of 31% of chargeable profits or 1.5% of total income for the tax year. In Gambia, oh that's in Gambia, yeah. Um, value added tax, VAT, at a standard rate of 15%. is payable on taxable supplies made in the Gambia, taxable imports of goods and on taxable supplies of imported services. So they pay ta value added tax as well. Um, what else do we have here? <sighs> oh yeah, um, there was also, also the question, is Gambia, is the Gambia a safe place to live? And I got, although Gambia is 95% Muslim, it's very laid back and generally are supportive of the Western lifestyle. Generally speaking, Gambia is a very safe place to live, which is reassuring. Um, unity is strength, of course, when all you all get together and you're bonding and you're um, strong, that is strength. You know, and it is important that that's what people do. I mean, we could do it here. I mean, I don't think by being an Africa, it's going to make that much a difference if your mindset is not that way. Unless Africa creates that mindset for you. I'm not sure. Um, Gambia, a little bit of history. Having been under both the French and British rule previously, Gambia gained independence in 1965 and has, also, and has also since withdrawn from the Commonwealth of the Nations. The official language of Gambia is English, but some other languages exist based on the indigenous ethnic groups within the country. Um, what else have I got here? I'm not going to go on for much longer, Pete. But for those who are thinking about um, moving to Gambia, repatriating to Gambia, I hope you're finding this useful. Um, just want to make sure that, I think I said this, but you know, I was thinking about when she was saying the UK was a dump because now she's living in the Gambia. We have to think about people like in Spain. They've moved to Spain but they don't call the UK a dump because they don't live here anymore. So I just think, you know, I don't want to belabor that, but it is important that um, we have to put this into perspective and realise that, yeah, you know, it really does depend on which part you live. You can't be telling people in Africa that England is a dump. And yes, there's poverty all over the place. And she's correcting her statistics. I mean, I mentioned that in an, in an earlier video that I did, not an earlier today, but a previous video I did. There are, there is a mass unemployment, there is poverty, there is homelessness. You know what I mean? So she's not wrong, but it's just that she didn't say anything good about it. She didn't even mention the free health care. You know what I mean? And also, she could benefit from dual nationality. She could even be saying, look, you know, I come from England. I prefer it in the Gambia, you know, and, but I'm going to keep my British nationality because it's beneficial for me. I mean, it can take me to nearly any country in the world at the, as things stand at the moment. We don't know how things are going to change after the EU. We don't know if we're going to have that power that we used to have. We probably won't. But anyway, um, but yeah, let me just put that down there. I've put about the miseducation, about how we've been miseducated growing up. Um, what else have we got here? Yeah, I've put that about we don't have to pay for treatment. Um, yeah, we also have to think about in Africa. Um, in those hospitals, you have to pay. You have to have health insurance. You have to make sure you may have to make sure your health insurance is current and valid. So you can't just go into um, one of the Gambian hospitals. And they said that if they, the few that they do have free, you might as well forget about the treatment that you're going to get. It's like you say, you get what you pay for if you don't pay nothing for it. But at least here in the UK, 
we go in and to a hospital free, you get the you get the service of somebody who's paying. So all of these um, international students and foreign nationals who are paying, you know, so much to use the service, we're getting that for free. You can't knock that. How much you have to pay in America? So we can't take the UK for granted. Regardless of it gives us a hard, it does give us a hard time. You've got the hostile environment policy. And the thing is, even if she mentioned about our black men, even if she said, you know, I prefer to live in Gambia because I'm worried about our black men being stopped every five minutes, being placed in prisons, which is equivalent to slavery, being placed in mental homes, being afraid to go outside because they're afraid to be stopped and searched, afraid to be deported, afraid of being um, wrongfully detained. Even if she used that as a reason for moving to the Gambia, it would it would carry more weight. But, you know, I just think she was kind of mixing two different things. You know, yes, yeah, she mentioned the racism, racism and the hostility, but then, you know, calling it a dump is just like two different things. Because, like I said, there's dumps everywhere. Um... And as we know, people in the, there's people in the US, they, they're afraid to go to hospital because they can't afford the insurance. So they stay with their illness, their sickness. I remember watching a video where one woman said, you know, I think her leg was severed. And she said, please don't call the ambulance because I think it's $2,500 if you call an ambulance. So she said, please, I don't even know what she did about her leg. Oh, what a thought. But then you kind of have to think how fortunate we are at this time. If after the EU we privatise and we're going to have to pay, we're going to be in the same state as America, if not worse, because it will be worse for people here because if there's so many people unemployed, where are they going to get the insurance from to pay for health insurance? They're not going to be able to. So what's going to happen? So it is going to be worse. So it may become a dump, you know, after the EU. I'm not saying that because we don't know what's going to happen to the UK after we leave the EU. We're not hearing very positive stories. We're not hearing very positive stories at all. So we don't know what's going to happen. And then we're talking about all these bloody um, super bugs coming in, killing off 10 million. I don't know how that sounds to you. So it doesn't sound too favourable. So maybe... It is time to repatriate. I don't know if you can get up before the 31st of October, though. Um, let me see. Yeah, Turkey is telling Syrians to go back home because they cannot accommodate them. So that's similar to what's happening in the UK. Um, Tanzanians are giving jobs to Kenyans because Kenyans can speak English. So they're now getting resentful because the Kenyans are taking the jobs that the Tanzanians want. But because they, the Tanzanians only speak their indigenous language, they're not being given the job. So there's being resentment being um, fueled there. And I'm saying that because the same thing could happen with Brits going to the Gambia. Too many of them taking over the jobs, taking, you know, high profiling and all that kind of stuff you don't know what's in the minds of the indigenous people who are struggling so like i said always be respectful always be kind and always be humble um yeah so those of you who thought that um africans were lived in mud huts barefoot flies poverty it's all about miseducation so um and that is what Juliet has learned. And she's quite she's quite widely travelled, so she probably knew that. But I think she's just excited at being where she is. And she probably deserves it. Um, just have to make sure that, you know, whoever goes over there, that you don't go over there with an attitude. Remember, you know how many Brits go over to Jamaica and um, get killed? And sometimes it's because the Brits have not an air of superciliousness, but they have this um, air about, some of them do, not all, 
that have an air about them. You have to make sure that you don't say anything to put people down because the culture is different. And what we think is funny, they won't think is funny. So you need to understand the language. You need to understand what is appropriate, what you can say from what you can't say so that you don't tick anybody off and you don't end up in a coffin somewhere with your organs taken out. This is no joke. You need to be aware of your surroundings, who you're with, what they have, who doesn't have. Don't go showing off with people who don't have. Next thing you'll know, they're teething out your things. So be careful. Um, and I want to give a, a shout out to Lulu Rashid. Lulu Rashid is a new vlogger. I think she's only got seven subscribers at the moment, but she's got a big Facebook following. But she's now coming out there and she's speaking up and I big up Lulu Rashid. Um, yeah, so if you want to pass by her, um, she's an African um, and she talks about social topics and she even commented on this video. Um, so, yeah, but she gave it from an African perspective, which was interesting. And she has an African following and they were um, more or less saying what I was saying in the sense that, you know, um, you have to, it all depends on where you live. Um, if you live in a slum, you're not going to have the same um, kudos as if as if you live somewhere somewhere else. So it's all this classism and social class and stuff like that. You know, I'd already I'd already written up my notes, and then I saw something, and I thought, oh, well, I've listened to that because it's always good to get things from a different perspective. It's so it's okay for me as a UK Brit speaking out on it but it's very even though that lady wasn't from Gambia but I believe one of her followers um was from the Gambia and she repatriated and she was the one that said she um, got a piece of land and she built the house for 50,000 so it's good to get that from the horse's mouth and that was recently so just so you can gauge how much you might need I reckon you know if you haven't got a job you need about a hundred grand if you're going to build your own house. If you're not going to build your own house and you're going to buy one already constructed, you're probably going to need about 200, 250 to tide you over until you get a job. If you start thinking like that, you have more than enough. You're not going to think, oh yeah, I'm going to go to this little African country that's not used to anything and oh, I'm going to build my house and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and go there with an attitude of entitlement and feel as though um, they haven't arrived. You know what I mean? You can't go over with that attitude because thing more and more people are going over is getting more and more expensive. So you have to be prepared to pay. You're not going over there to take advantage. You're not going over there to exploit. You're going over there to live because the food is better. You don't have to use electric. Uh, you've got beautiful weather. And with any luck, if you've got enough money, you can have a beautiful home and lovely black people around you. And that's all for now. Bye bye.